But I do want to talk to you about something that's just been in my heart. It's been pressing upon me. But before I do that, uh, did y'all hear about the young boy that was attending church on Sunday morning and he was kind of lingering around in the foyer and he saw on the foyer, on the foyer wall a list of those who had died in service. And so we do we recognize all of you veterans today and thank you so much. And he saw this list and there's just all these names of people who had died in service from that local church, you know, over the years, many years since the church had been in existence. And, and uh, so he looked around and, and he just was kind of disturbed by it. So he went up to his father and he said, Daddy, he said, there's a list out there of people who died in service. He said, which service was that, the morning or the evening? <laughs> right? I know that's an old joke. Some of you are saying you're out of date. But anyway, uh, best I could do for Veterans Day, right? So go ahead and look at uh, Psalm chapter 2. I'm just going to read from my notes. I want to talk to you about something that's been burning in my heart. And it started not this week, which I'm going to tell you a short, brief little story. But it's something that took place. But not, it didn't start with that. It started prior to that. And I have had in my heart... Um, I don't know how to say this other than just to say it. Can I just say it? I've been somewhat discouraged with ministry in a particular area, not with the church, not with what I'm doing here. I'm actually uh, encouraged in what's going on at New Life, and uh, God's bringing new families in. We've got good plans upcoming for the season and for the next year. We've got great leadership. Lord's raising up people. and bring, It's just really amazing what's happening that some of you wouldn't even be aware of. You look at the size of our congregation and we're not a large congregation, but there are about twice as many of you as there are if everybody were to be here on the same day. And so we've got a good running start to impact our community and do as the disciples did in their day and turn the world upside down. How many of you know we could turn the world upside down if we would do it? Do you know that, that we could do that? Uh, and so we're all on board with that. And then we should ask ourselves, beginning with me, then why haven't we done it? And so that's not to be negative, it's just to say we need to check ourselves. And so this morning, I want to share some things with you that I hope will check us, bring us into check where we are as people, as a church, as believers. And, uh, and so what, what, what's on my heart, I told you that something had been burning on my heart that I was somewhat discouraged with. It's not doing ministry in the church and preaching. We have a lively bunch. You guys love the Lord. You love hearing the Word. Uh, when I preach, I feel that you're attentive, that you listen, other than the 30 that sleep, but everybody gets tired. Uh, that's a joke. No, you know, we have a really attentive, good body. I've said this before, I'll tell you again. I have, as we have guest speakers come through here, almost without fail, they will tell me before they leave, Pastor, this is one of the best churches I've been in. They tell me this over and over. These are different guys. They say, your worship is great. Your people are excited. They were engaged when I was preaching. And I don't see that at most of the places I go. That's what I'm told. And I've been told that for years. And so then you ask, then, then why don't we just really grow, 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 grow? And the fact is we do. We run over 1,000 people a year, 800 of them out the back door. But we run a big group of people, right? <laughs> And uh, so why is that? And I'm asking you an honest question. I say it in jest, and you know I'm joking. But you do know that uh, turnover is just a part of the church world today. I hate to say that, but the church is so much like culture in general until we act like culture in general. The average family in the United States moves. Or if they own a home, they sell it every four years they move. Did you know that? That's unbelievable. That's unthinkable. When I was young, people rarely moved once in their life. Most families, when they were able to purchase a home, they stayed in that home for the remainder of, of their family life. Well, that's changed. We're in a transit culture. Our businesses transfer us. Our jobs transfer. We're not happy. We, we go through midlife crises and change jobs, and that moves us, and we just can't seem to get settled. Our families are breaking up and splitting apart, sometimes two and three times. So kids are moving. They're transitioning. Uh, Lori was talking to someone not too long ago, and we were talking about children, how difficult it is on the children of our generation today. That, and, and she brought something to light that we had not thought of. And, and she was talking about a public school system. Daisy, you, you would definitely be familiar with this. Daisy was a, a teacher of the year not too, too long ago and here in Columbia. And, and so, uh, yeah, we're, that's, that's right. She's a blessing. And so for that reason, you should attend her Sunday school class. She will fire you up. But come, come up ready to get charred by the Spirit because he's on fire. But uh, 
But so, we, what this lady pointed out was, she said it's really hard to teach a lot of our underprivileged, more underprivileged children in, in our community, and I guess this is nationwide, because of the fact that the parents who are in poverty, single mothers for the most part raise children in poverty, that's statistical, and those parents who are in 40% of the homes in the United States of America have a one parent, one parent in them. Did, did, can you believe that? 40% of the homes in America are, are singles, I'll put it that way, and if they have children, they're in that number. And so, because of that, these children are being, risen, being raised in, in po po poverty issues. Well, the problem is they can't make their rent often. So when they can't make their rent, they get thrown out of their apartment, and they have to move to another apartment. And at that apartment, uh, they're only there for a few more months. And so some of these kids are changing schools four times a year. And they cannot learn. You can't teach a child when they're changing teachers, changing classes, changes curriculums all year long. And so our culture has brought all this stuff upon us. And you and I know if you backtrack to why we've gotten to those places and many other things, it's simply because, and I don't want to simplify it too much, but it's the truth, they took prayer out of, out of our schools in 1962, was it? 61, 62? And I, you know, it wasn't that early because I remember prayer in school. And I was born in, I was born in uh, 82. And, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So, but I do remember prayer in school. I was talking to somebody this week. I remember we would go in, first class. Uh, the first thing we would do is class stand, we're going to pray. And we would open up, we'd bow our heads, and we'd all pray. Somebody would pray. The first thing that I memorized and quoted, when I had to memorize something to say it in the morning, we would say the pledge, we would pray, and one student would come up and share something they had to memorize. And I, you got to choose what you memorized. The first thing that I quoted was, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores, you know, and I quoted, that, that was the first thing that I spoke in third grade that I memorized after prayer. And so when you remove God from the public and you have a godless society, people begin to stray from their basic foundation of morality. And when morality breaks down, it, it filters down to the family unit. And when it goes beyond that, the whole, family, the whole nation begins to disintegrate. And y'all and know that's pretty much true, right? Yeah. And so what's happened is as the society degrades, uh, I, I, I made this word up years ago when I was real young. I preached a sermon I called it de a, a series. I called it de-evolution. De-evolution. Instead of evolving to become better people the way uh, the, the, uh, the scientific world wants us to think we evolved as a people, we really are de-evolving from what God created us to be when Adam fell in the garden and we're going backwards in some senses and all that kind of made that word up. And believe it or not, within the last year, I actually heard it used. And I thought, yeah, that was my word, you know, but uh, nobody knew that I did. But anyway, so, so here we are. And we have gone from being the voice in America that drove many decisions that were made, even from the government, down to we are the voice that is being stifled and snuffed out. And, and we're the people who are being mocked and made fun of on the news. You can be of any faith, of any belief, of any philosophy or theology, as long as you don't bring Christianity or Christ into the picture. When you do that, you're going to be humiliated. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be cut off. And so where are we and what are we supposed to do with that? I tell you, this is not the first time that America has been at this place. It's happened several times. And though we were founded, we believe on Christian principles and on the Bible and on uh, 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 just biblical, biblical matters. There have been many times that our country has taken this dip in morality and in spirituality and had revival and been taken back up. It can happen again. It can absolutely happen again. And we cannot buy into it. But what has to happen for that to take place is two things. And the first one is prayer. If my people who are called by my name will do what? Somebody finish it. Humble themselves and pray. Turn from their wicked ways. Humble themselves and pray. Then God said, I will hear from heaven and I will... 
heal their land. So there's two things we got to do. And of course, you can break that scripture down and preach a whole sermon on all the different points in there. You know, we, don't, we got to turn away from our sin. We got to pray. We got to da da da. Hear from heaven. We got to hear God. Blah, blah, blah. Do these things, and God said He restore our nation. But the first one is prayer, it generalizes all of those. What's the second thing we have to do? We've got to speak. We have to speak. And what I want to share with you in the next today, and God knows how long it will take to do it, is the importance of the speaking. The Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Paul said, I'm not ashamed to talk about Christ and what he did. And the reason I'm not ashamed of it is it is the preaching of the gospel that changes lives, that saves people, that inevitably saves a nation and a world. He said, I'm not afraid of the gospel. And then, not far from that, in the book of Romans, he went on and he said this, For how will they know without a preacher? Everybody say, how would I have known had there not been a preacher? Now, maybe a preacher didn't lead you to the Lord, but probably somebody preached to somebody who heard the message who told you, and you know because of a preacher. You may know because of Billy Graham off television. You may know because of somebody who preached in the 1800s, whatever. You don't know, but somebody preached. And so now you can all breathe out and say, I'm off the hook. I'm not a preacher. Can you do that? No, you can't do that. We all are supposed to preach. We're not all called a pastor. We're not all called evangelists, prophets. Da, 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 pa- He's appointed some to be pastors, some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And everybody says, yeah, I didn't get any of that. <laughs> Thank God. So I can go to work and uh, manage my people at work, and, and, I'm, and I'm okay. No, uh, you, you may not be called to a five-fold ministry, but you're absolutely commissioned to share what God has put in your heart. And you may say, well, brother, pastor, I just don't know the word like you do. I can't quote scriptures. I can't do this. Listen, you have a personal testimony. And if you'll just share that testimony, it in itself can do as much as, as I could do quoting a ton of scriptures. Because you can touch people where they're at and they can see that somebody who's on their level, and, and I'm talking about biblical knowledge, somebody that's on their level with biblical knowledge is right there with them has experienced something that changed them and caused them to so believe the Bible that it can make them want to have the same thing. So I was uh, at coffee shop, not Buckheads, what's the new one? Downtown, Milltown Coffee. Milltown Coffee is taking us by storm. I don't know if you know that or not. Buckets is selling them. Everybody else is. These people are going crazy. A couple of young men started a business here in town. They, brew, they, they roast their own coffee, and they started selling it. And they go to coffee shops all around the state. They're branching out, and they are just from Columbia, Tennessee. They're taking, taking the coffee world by storm, Sam. From Columbia. from Columbia, Tennessee. And it doesn't have anything to do with Colombian beans either. But... <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Yes, somebody needs to talk to him, right? You can't do that from here. We're, we're in Colombia. Nothing good comes out of Colombia. Sounds like something biblical, right? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Okay. <laughs> Only a few of you even got that. So anyway, so I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, I'm there. Uh, actually, Daniel gave me this wonderful haircut. Daniel, the guy that sang, he's a barber downtown. You need to go visit Daniel. A lot of you need to go visit Daniel. And... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so anyway, uh, so I'm in the coffee shop and I run into a youth pastor from a local church here in town, which I have a high respect for this particular church. And I have a high respect for the ministry there and what they're accomplishing, what they're doing. I have a lot, lot, lot of respect for a lot of churches in Columbia. Thank God for them. And uh, so I get to talking to this youth pastor. He recognized me. I didn't recognize him. And but I knew I'd supposed to know him and we started talking and he oh yeah 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 right so we got to talking and uh, I had some work to do I had my computer setting out I never got back to it because we had such a good conversation just talking about the Lord and what God's doing in our churches and in our community and all that kind of stuff and and at the end of it I said oh man I said he, he got to talking about Chris our son who's a worship leader in Texas and I and, I, and so I he brought it up you know and so I told him yeah he just resigned his position I've told you all this because his pastoral staff told him that he can no longer sing any songs that talk about the blood of Jesus. 
can't, can't go there. And so Chris gracefully resigned. Uh, if you know me, you know what I would have done at that moment. But, uh, but Chris has got a lot more wisdom than his father. And, uh, and he resigned. Actually, I'll just tell you this. The Lord gave me a word. I actually had a prophetic word that I spoke over Chris when he was about 10 to 12 years old. The Lord gave me this word in study, when I was studying and praying, and I'd been studying about David. David, the Bible says, was a man of war. He was a bloody man. He killed, you remember the saying, David killed his, Saul killed his thousands, David killed his tens of thousands. Well, David was a bloody man. He was a man of war. He fought for God. He was fearless. And he literally, personally, with his own hand, slaughtered thousands of people. Now, you don't think about David like that, do you? We don't want to think about David like that because that just doesn't fit in our peaceful society that we live in. You're not supposed to do that kind of stuff. Unless, of course, you're Muslim and then, you know, it's really not our business what they do. That's their religion. As long as you don't come to America. Y'all understand I didn't mean that, right? Y'all got quiet like you're thinking, does the preacher really think that? No, the preacher doesn't <laughs> think that. But, but that's what the media and the left think. Leave it alone. That's their religion. Unless, of course, you're Christian and we don't want you to do certain things that might be wrong in God's eyes. And then we need to be persecuted for that. But anyway, so I'm talking to this guy. I'm telling him about it. And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm the generation before my son. Y'all get that. That's how, kind of how that works. And so I'm uh, old school. And my dad was older school. My grandfather was much older school. And I can look back, just like you younger people can, and I can see how things have changed and evolved and, and philosophically, theologically, how things have changed and brought us to where we're at today, what we think is right, what we think is wrong, what they thought was wrong that we don't think is wrong. Uh, for instance, I remember when, when uh, in 1970s, I, I actually remember attending church where if you came to church and your hair was grown over your ears and you were a male, they would stop you at the door and tell you to leave. Couldn't come in church unless you go home, respect yourself, cut your hair. Sam, Sam remembers. Had to cut my hair once before. Yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that again. Uh, no, I'm teasing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that, that's how it was. Ladies wore dresses to church, or you were a disgrace, and you got called names, and it was really ugly. And, and we know that stuff's ridiculous, right? Uh, I've been through all kind of fads in my life. I, I did the I'm cool fad when, in the, in the, when I was in my 40s and tried to dress like everybody that was in their 30s because that's what all the other preachers were doing, and now I'm back to a suit. Why? Because I feel good in a suit, and that's what I want to do. It really don't matter. But we've been through all kinds of crazy fads and phases and this is, and all of it is just stuff that really didn't have a whole lot, if anything, to do with preaching the gospel. And so we have played church so well for so long until we've allowed our agreement with the world to let the world swell up like some kind of yeast or something and just grow and swell up till now it's running over us and we're being snuffed out. I don't know if my, it, but the way I'm trying to explain this is working well, but y'all get what I'm talking about. Now the things that we wanted to be a part of because it looked good and cool and fun in the world, because we went there too much as the church in general, we've lost our reverence, we've lost that peculiarity that Peter said we were supposed to have. We're no different than the world. The statistics are the same when it comes to sin, crime, divorce, all that nonsense. They're the same in the church for the most part as they are in the world today. We, know, we, we look like they do. And we're not supposed to. We're supposed to be different. And I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying us. I'm saying the church. You know what I'm saying. Some of it, you know, it used to be even that we would say, you know, if you've got sin A, B, or C in your life, you can't come to church. And so we'd, we'd, we'd tell them, oh, you know, you're doing this and you can't come to church. And I remember, I remember not too many years ago, if you were living together, you were told you cannot come to church. I'm talking about within the last decade. If you were living together as a couple outside of holy matrimony, you were not to come to the local church until you got that right. That's crazy. You know, how are they going to hear the word, hear the gospel? How are they going to be convicted? But when they come in, I'm not saying they, I'm talking about any kind of sin, anything that you and I have 
that nobody knows about, we get to come. Hello? So, with that and where I'm about to go, know my heart that what God is doing again that we're about to see like we haven't seen in a long time is he's about to draw a line in the sand. And that sounds fun, but that ain't fun. Because when the line gets drawn and there's black and there's white, there's usually not a whole lot on the good side. And so you can become, well, let's just read it from Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations gather together? Do you know that that statement written by David in the book of Psalms was prophetic of more than one thing, I'm sure. Usually they are. But definitely of our day. He says, why do the nations gather together? We've not seen a day in humanity like today where the nations are even capable, we're even capable of gathering together like they can today due to technology. Huh? Why do the nations rage? Yes, this translation is, why do the nations gather together? It's, it, they, they use the term rage in that translation. This translation is breaking it down. They're coming together with rage. And you'll see that break out as I go through the, uh, the rest of this. And you'll see it even in this. Why do they rage? Why do they gather together? Why are they coming together? Next verse. Why do people devise useless plots? Kings take their stands. Rulers make plans together against the Lord and against His Messiah by saying, let's break apart their chains and shake off their ropes. He's saying there's coming a time when nations will gather together. People will come together and they will rage against the church. And they will say, now listen to what they say. And they will say, let's break apart their chains and shake off their ropes. In other words, let's stop the church with this suppressing and debilitating laws. This is what they think, is that we're all about snuffing out their fun. We're just, we're just people who just want to be a problem for, for the rest of the world. We're the thorn in the flesh of the world. This is what the world sees the church as. And he said, why? He's asking the question, why is this happening? And they said, let us break apart their chains and shake off their ropes. Let's do whatever we can to push the church out and to break off all the restraint that they have on us as people in the world. So they rise up against the church. And he goes on and he says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. God sits there and he laughs while this goes on. Aren't you glad about that? I mean, you know, God sits in heaven and he laughs. Now that ought to help you a little bit right now. If you think about it, uh, God is not surprised by anything. So he sits in the heavens and he laughs. The Lord, this is this translation, it says the Lord makes fun of them. And then he speaks to them in his anger. In his burning anger, he terrifies them by saying, listen to how God scares the world. You ready? I have installed my own king on Zion, my holy mountain. In other words, he's saying Jesus is the king. And his enemies hate hearing about Jesus. What makes the nations rage? Why do they rise up? Why do they want to break the chains that, we, that they think we have on them? Why do they want to destroy our morality of our faith in our churches, in our homes, in our lives? Why do they want to do all that? Because they hate the name of Jesus. And because God sits in heaven and laughs and he says, go ahead, act like you want, say what you want, think you're going to accomplish what you're going to accomplish. But guys, I got news for you, world. I have a king that I have established in Zion and he's going to rule with an iron hand and you're never going to defeat him. The gates of heaven, gates of hell will not prevail against you as a church. And so we can get depressed or fearful or, or disgusted. Like I said, I've been somewhat, you know, when I was started off, I was telling you, I've been somewhat dis, what's a good word? Huh? 
And Lori said discombobulated. Bobulated. I was thinking of disheartened as a good one. Uh, there was another one I heard one time. It was a really good word. It's not coming back right now. Disillusion. There's a good one. Okay, all these terms. At, at this fact, not at what God's doing at New Life Church or in Columbia, Tennessee or, or whatever. Not at that. But at how deafened the world is now to our message. I remember a day when I could go out street witnessing or door-to-door witnessing, go to the bars downtown Dallas, go to the streets uh, that were the homosexual gay bars, and I could go out and witness and preach and pass out flyers and talk to people about the Lord, and they would stop and give me the respect to listen to what I had to say. And they might question, and some of them might have some rebuttal and some argument, but for the most part, conviction would fall on people. Today I go out and I'm, I'm in a context where, where there are people and, and I, I just want to, I, I, you know, mostly it's our younger generation because they've been trained, raised up in public school systems and, and now into our universities that teach everything anti-Christ. And so they don't know. They don't know. A family in our own church whose son has been raised in local schools. God, love, God, thank God for our local public schools. I'm not damning our schools. We need our schools, but we need more Christian teachers in our schools like Daisy who won't teach those worldly philosophies and, and, and won't present those things that are anti-Christ. Uh, but told me last week, you know, that their son was, who definitely is fully Christian, loves the Lord, knows the Lord, has adopted some of the philosophy that there are many paths to heaven. Many, many paths. Why? That's just being, that's filtering down through that generation. And so now, uh, I, I am just, when I try to talk to people and explain to them that there is one way. Paul said, it is at the name of Jesus that you, uh, that you must be saved. I mean, I could, I've preached a lot of sermons on that. Y'all have heard me. I'm, I'm, I'm dogmatic about that. There's only one way. And so now we're an offense to the world because we think we're better than everybody else because we think we have, we're the only ones with the only path. No, we don't think that. It's just simple. It's intellectual thinking. And that's what they want you to think is you're not intellectual if you believe that. But true intellectual thinking reasons things down to the base. And... There cannot be many gods and many paths. It doesn't make sense. It's not true. And I I don't have time to get into all that, but you know what I'm saying. And so he's saying, look, there's coming a time when the nations are going to rage. People are going to rise up. They're going to rise up against the church. They're going to want to snuff us out because we are a thorn in their side. And and we're not to be discouraged of that because God's sitting up in the heavens. Yet I have been. Because I try to talk to people, and it's not what it used to be. I read one time, and this was like 20 years ago. A guy wrote, and he said, you know, he said back in the 50s, and he had been in, in the ministry back in the 50s and everything. He said back in the 50s, he said it was about, if you, if you said everybody was on a scale of 1 to 10 that you go to share the gospel with. He said in the 50s, most people were at a 7. He said, if you preach Jesus to them, if you gave them the gospel in a good, understandable way, you were loving and caring how you did it, and, and, and you just told them about Jesus. Most people were at a seven, and you had to move them to an eight, nine, and a ten to get them saved, and that might take however much time it would take. But they could get it. They could hear it at the level of a seven. They were open seven out of ten to listen. He said, today, the average person in the community is, is, is about a four. So before you could lead them to the Lord, you got to move them from a 4 to a 5 to a 6 to a 7 to an 8 to a 9 and to a 10 to get them born again. Y'all follow what I mean by that? And so that was about 20 years ago. And I dare say today, public in, at large is probably a 1 to a 2. You've got to move them to a 2, to a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 to get people to accept the message because they have been so indoctrinated with doctrines of devils, lies, things that... that, uh, that other religions have infiltrated into our philosophical thinking and our. It, Google. This is exactly right. People have a question today, they Google. And who you think answered the questions on Google? 
there's some good ones? <laughs> the government. <laughs> and that's the truth. Oh, well, so, but we're not to be, we're not to take it to heart like that. God's laughing about it. We need to learn to laugh about it. He said, I'll, I'll announce the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your own possession. You'll break them with an iron scepter. You will smash them to pieces like pottery. And that's what Jesus is going to do in the end. We are going to win. Amen. Amen. Yeah. amen. You better amen that. Now you kings act wisely. He's about to say something to all of the world that is against Christ. And he starts off by speaking to their authorities because you speak to the authority if you want to speak to the body, the people. He says, be warned, you earth, rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son or He will become angry and you will die on your way because your anger will burst into flames. His anger will burst into flames. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in Him. Amen. A child runs toward a busy highway as adults look on, but no one bothers to stop him for fear of offending his parents. Patient sit in emergency room, a patient, bleeding profusely, but no doctor will see her, supposing that she should tend to her own matters. A Geiger counter warns of an impending 8.0 earthquake in Japan, but the seismologist refused to warn the public, fearing a backlash from the media if by chance their calculations are off. A nation is overthrown from within, while an arrogant Senate argue over tax reform. Their concerns are political in re-election. And like the Titanic, the world heads towards an iceberg of eternal destruction as the church twiddles her thumbs and plugs her ears to the awakening cry of the angels proclaiming, how will they know without a preacher? And that's the world we live in. That we sit back and people have just... We're getting to this place where you're afraid to do anything because it'll backlash on you. If you do something good... You're going to be accused of doing something evil. Right? If you do something evil, the world will applaud you as if you did something good. You know, there's a verse I had on this side. Let me get back over there. Here it is. Y'all remember in uh, Isaiah, you probably heard this, but Isaiah warned this generation uh, when he said in Isaiah 5.20, how horrible it will be for those who call evil good and good evil. Who turn darkness into light and light into darkness. Who turn what is bitter into something sweet and what is sweet into something bitter. What, what happens as people begin to adopt sin and immorality that God deems as evil and wrong. As people begin to adopt that as okay and good their whole perspective on right and wrong begins to change. And so you can take it so far as to the Muslim culture. There's a few of you in here who have been to Iraq and, and uh, to maybe Desert Storm, some of the different, different wars, or even just culturally been over there. So I think there's maybe one of you here who worked over there. And they can tell you the culture over there is nothing like the culture is here. When you remove Christ from a culture... Morality bottoms out. The, the Muslim males are not directly interested as a whole in females. They're interested in young boys. You see, y'all don't know this because they don't tell us this stuff. They have young boys as toys. And I'll just leave it at that for the children who are in here. This is common culture. When our soldiers go over there to fight, they're told, stay out of the culture. You do not understand it. Keep your hands off of it. You and I know it's morally d disgusting. But what it raises is another generation of males with the same propensity for the same sin. And because they're prone to that, they hate females. So they cover their faces... And they hide them under garbs. 
But they have to have them for reproduction and for pleasure when they want that. And women are demeaned to be less than animals. Dogs are treated better than the females. And that's what happens when you take Christ out of a culture. Men begin to decide what they want, and they deem that morally right and acceptable. Muhammad himself married, there's two tales of it, either a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old. Nine is what you've heard. And, it's, and it was, quote-unquote, a legal marriage at the time. Recently, I read, actually it's been a couple of years ago, I read that in one of the countries over there, Syria, Egypt, one of them, one of the, the uh, uh, now the, thought, the term leaves my mind, but one of the hierarchy who makes the laws in the Muslim faith over there ruled, and you're not even going to believe this, that it is morally acceptable for a man to have sex with a female at the age of one, so far as his body weight does not harm her. And you're like, what? That's right. And now I'm going to say something to you to help you think a little different. There was a day that I remember at my age where it was unthinkable that a man would lie with a man at all. And so I'm at the coffee shop talking to this youth pastor, and we're talking about this situation, and, 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 and we're talking about the good things going on in the community, and then it comes up that my son Chris, his worship leader, just resigned his church because he was told he couldn't sing about the blood of Christ anymore, and has to take it, you can't sing songs that have the blood in them, you weren't in here, Daniel, when I said that. And so Chris resigned, a good position, making more money than I'm making, and he resigned his position, and I said, you know, not only that, I said, but the church has accepted homosexuality as just, uh, it's just an, it's a thing, you know, we love these people and they can do whatever they want and they're okay. it's okay. And we do love these people. They're just people with a sin. And I'm not talking about people who are homosexual. I'm talking about a morally unacceptable, sinful act. Y'all with me on that? And so I said, as I say, because I'm old school, not old school, old school, old school. Because that generation puts you in prison for it. And I don't know if you know that. In the United States of America. You went to prison. But because I'm old school. But not old school, old school, old school. I shared just the old school view. And I said. He didn't handle it quite the way I would. I said. And I've told Roy this. I said. You know. Chris is just. Man. He told his church. Bye. Went on Facebook. It's been great ministering. God bless your church. I hope things go well for you. He resigned. Gave him his fair notice. And he gracefully stepped out. I would have. And y'all just going to have to understand me. I would have. As soon as they said it. Y'all know what would happen. Are you kidding me? And I would have had that conversation. I would have had that conversation. If I were wanted to divide the body today, I would say, raise your hand if you would have had that conversation. And all of us over the age of 40 likely would have raised our hand. Don't raise your hands. But if I, and those of you under 40 likely would not have raised your hands or you would have contemplated what you would have done. And that shows what's happening as we're going to generation to generation to generation to generation. And it won't stop till men are legalized to have sex with any human being or animal they want. Now, you don't have to like that, but that's what happens. We have a moral standard. We have a moral code. It's the law and the prophets. And so what I was going to share with you today as I always say at 12 o'clock when I haven't got to my sermon yet <laughs> is and maybe we'll look at it next week maybe, matter of fact maybe you would go home and read next week uh, uh, Acts chapter 6 and 7 particularly 7 but 6 and 7 and you'll read about a sermon that Stephen preached to the church and he starts off like a Chris Martin, my son. And he ends up like a Daryl Martin. <laughs> or better yet, an Owen Martin, my granddaddy. <laughs> and, 
And what we've got to what we've got to come to uh, to realization of, and I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. I'm not going to try to try to keep going because I was just kind of in. that was an introduction, whatever. But what we've got to know is this: How will they know without a preacher? How will they know what? If I could say anything to leave you with this morning, it would be a call, a cry. A cry from the depths of my heart to those of you that are under 40, under 30, under 20, to start reading your Bible and close your ears to to the culture and start preaching what your Bible says. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Gentile. And young person, it's your generation that is getting left behind. I remember not many years ago standing in this pulpit and saying to you, statistics are that in short order, less than 4 to 3% of our teenagers in school will even know the Lord. We've now surpassed that. And it's time to turn it around. It's time to turn around. One truly anointed, called young man or young woman, full of the Holy Ghost, totally disconnected with their day and their culture, who will rise up like the young prophets in the Bible and begin to speak, may be killed for it, but might save a nation. And we've got to be willing to go there. The reason we have this Bible is because they were willing to go here. And the sermon that Stephen preaches basically is this. He tells all of them. He said, listen, he goes back and he retracts all the way from the Old Testament major things, the events of Israel. He's talking to the Jews. He goes back. He retracts from Abraham, how they came. God brought Abraham out. He goes into Moses. He talks about Moses. He said, this same Moses. And he talks all about Moses and what he did. And then he goes on. And he's going through and he's preaching the Old Testament in a flash, 57 verses, if you will. And, and he's telling them, look, you guys came from the God who chose you to be the apple of his eye, who has been with you, walked with you, anointed you, called you, appointed you, picked you out among all the people of the earth to be his people. And you've always killed the prophets. He said, which of the prophets did you not kill? And he goes from, he starts off with this, men and brethren, I'm a brother with you. I'm among you. You know what he says about Moses? He says Moses was in the congregation. And he begins to talk to him about Moses. See, we don't think of Moses as being in the congregation. We think of Moses as being the big great guy that stands up top and calls down fire and, and splits Red Seas and all that. But Moses was a man like you and I. And he goes in, and I, I, I won't go into the rest of this. I need to say this for next week. But listen. Who will rise up and be the voice for your generation? Because I cannot do it. And others my age and other adults can't reach the people you can reach. I may be talking to two people in this room in the, in the, in the right category. I don't know. But who's going to do it? There's actually a verse in, in, uh, in the book of Acts that says, in his generation, David. And it talks about him. Listen, you only have one generation. And I have one generation. And you've got to reach your generation. And I've got to reach mine. And then we've got to reach outside of that as far as we can. But we've got to do something. We've got to speak up. We've got to care. Stephen finished his sermon by letting them have it (laughs) in a good way. He was trying to save them. He called them stiff-necked, bone-headed, deaf, blind. He said, you always kill the prophets. And this is interesting. Matter of fact, I'm just going to say these last few things. I'm going to try to get them in three minutes, and then I'm going to let you go so I don't have to come back to this next week. This is interesting. They they went and they got him. They picked him. They captured him. 
they, they, they seized him and brought him before the Jerusalem council. And the reason they did that was because he had become a deacon and in the name of Christ was doing all kinds of miracles, literal miracles were happening at his, his hands and his ministry. And so they hated that, so they called him in before the council and they, they, they chewed him out and who are you doing this, why are you doing this? And, and then he said, tell us what, if, and then they accused him of all kinds of things he wasn't doing. And then the council said, councilman said, okay, then tell, you tell us. And, he, and don't ever ask a preacher to tell you because they will. And he did. And he told this, he preached this whole sermon to him. And he started out on a really good note. But by the time he's over, he could tell that they were not listening. But get this. This is what you got to get on this whole sermon. Before the sermon preached, he says, The council saw Stephen as the face of an angel. They looked at him and they, it was like they were looking into the face of an angel. Now watch this. So he preaches this whole sermon, and it's like they're looking at an angel, and he's telling them about their forefathers, their history, how God loved them, called them, brought them, delivered them, set them out of, free out of Egypt, and he's looking at them, and they're looking at him. He's talking with the face of an angel, and then at the end of it, he can tell that they're still not hearing, and God begins to change the spirit and it becomes prophetic. Then he starts speaking as a prophet. And he says, you killed all the prophets. He has no concern for his own life whatsoever. You killed them all. And they rose up on him, gnashing their teeth. And they killed him while Apostle Paul stood there and watched. Because he was not the apostle, he was Saul, the soldier. And they killed him. Now, I thought it was really interesting that it said they saw his face as the face of an angel. And when you begin to look, he even says in there that the law was delivered to you by the angels. The angels brought the law, and, then, and there are different things in that, and they were sent to give warnings and give messages. This is in Hebrews. He talks about, God talks about it, or the writer talks about it in Hebrews. Angels would be sent to bring messages. Stephen says they, they delivered the law to you. The angels that delivered the law to their forefathers, which in some translation, I don't want to get too far here for you, but some, trans, some people say that translates out to be sets, messengers and it means men of God. It could be speaking to the prophets. But whatever these angels were, that came in the spirit of the Lord and delivered the law to their forefathers that their forefathers then killed, they saw the same spirit on Stephen. The exact same spirit. Because nothing changes unless the gospel changes it. And only then when people open their ears and they hear what the voice of the Lord is saying. And so Stephen gets up and he preaches. They run on him and they kill him. Now here's the interesting thing. This may, and we don't know, but this may well have been the first sermon that Paul heard preached. Because three chapters later in chapter 9, 7, 8, 9, chapter 9, Paul gets approached by the Lord, knocked off a horse, his eyes are open, Jesus talks to like shut, and Jesus talks to him, he gets blind, and, and uh, a whole nother story, a whole nother sermon, I'm sorry. But that, that could have been the first sermon. That could have been the message that began stirring and brewing in his heart so that when Jesus appeared to him, he, he got it. So he, the seeds that were planted. So here's the point. Stephen went out a martyr, killed for Christ. His final words may have been the words when he stood up and he spoke without any reserve, no fear of man, no love of his own life. He laid down his life for the cause. When he spoke his final words, those may have been the words that planted the seeds in the Apostle Paul's heart that then later, he, Apostle Paul wrote a third of the Bible. And you and I sit here this morning receiving a message that became Bible because one man was willing to die for the cause. Right? What can you do? What can you say that will change the world? A 
whole lot. Maybe a very little is all you need to say. We've got to do it. Stand up with me. I'm going to start publishing that our, our Sunday morning services are over at 1, and I'll let you all out 45 minutes early every week. <laughs> Are you willing to speak if God will give you something to say? I am, I, let me tell you what I'm not asking you young people to do. I'm not asking you to be old school like me. I got to do what I got to do. I, I didn't finish the story at the coffee shop. I won't, I won't even finish it. It was very disheartening by the time I got, I will finish. I got to the end of the conversation with him, told him about Chris, told him what was happening. Then I said, it's really the deeper problem with the church where Chris is at is now they've opened up their doors to homosexuals to get involved in ministry and anything there. And so that's, you know, you can see how this, and this is, whether you know it or not, it's very common in Christendom now. And this youth pastor that I do have respect for, I do, I do believe he loves the Lord, and I, I do. I said, well, I could see on his face that when I went there, that was a problem for him. And so I said, well, I said, look, I said, I get it. I said, I know that your culture wouldn't deal with these matters the way I would. He said, no, nah, no, we wouldn't. He said, well, you know, he said, at least not on ministry teams. And so if you're my age, you heard something there. If you're not, maybe you did. And I'm not trying to divide us. I'm trying to say, I need, your, God needs your, your culture to reach your culture. That's what I'm trying to say. But what I heard was, well, you know, I'm okay with people in that circumstance being involved fully and wholly, and there's no reserve there because we love them. And we love people, again, talking about an act, not talking about. And, so, and I hate to always go back to that sin because there's a lot of sins, but that sin, believe it or not, is the epitome of sin in the Scripture. It is the worst of the worst. I, you know, I don't know how else to say it. It's an abomination in the eyes of God, the Bible says. It's a, we don't need to go preach against sin, but we need to preach Jesus. That's what we need to do it. And when you do it, people are going to get mad. But some of them are going to get saved. And some of them, are going to become Apostle Paul's and write a new history for the church. But it's got to start if we got to talk. So let's pray. Lord, don't even know how to pray this morning, Father, really. I, I guess I do. So I'm asking you, Lord, I, I think back in the Old Testament how the spirit of a prophet would sometimes be passed to another prophet. Lord, that I think of Elijah who cast his mantle on Elisha. And when Elisha took up the mantle of the prophet, he took up the spirit of the prophet. And this is not cultural differences of who's old school and who's cutting edge and who's out of touch. This is a spiritual matter. We wrestle not against flesh and blood and natural things, but against demonic forces that are coming to try to destroy a culture and a nation and young people. So Lord, I just pray that you would take off the spirit of the prophets in the Word of God and put that upon all of us. Lord, those that the religious unbelieving killed had words that were spoken that to this very day a life impacting for us life changing, life altering for us when we read them Lord it is the word of God that was spoken by holy men who were moved upon by the Holy Spirit the Bible says God I pray that you would move upon us move upon my generation who have become so lax and it's my generation who dropped the ball it's not the 
the next generation or the one after that. It's my generation who dropped the ball. So God, I call out to you this morning, God, for those who are in my generation, that we would turn from our wicked ways, hear from heaven, respond to your voice, and cry out that you save this nation, Lord. Lord, I just ask you to move on this, God. All I can do is ask. Speak to us, Father. Lead us. Do with us what you want to do. In Jesus' name. You may be here this morning. You may not know the Lord, but maybe what I... What, what I've said somehow identifies with you and you understand that you want to be a part of a nation and a culture that have good strong morals where you can be safe and not worry about somebody running in your church with a machine gun that, that culture that God intends for us to have and to live with and you might just identify with the fact that the, the Bible, the word of God is all about good culture wants to take good out and call good evil and evil good. Well, it starts for you in meeting the Master Himself, Jesus.